This is the Tame Aperture Podcast. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That's when you know you're old and out of shape. <laughs> I know it's exactly what you mean. Uh, okay. Welcome to the Tame Aperture Podcast, where we talk all things movies from first-time directors, indie films, art house, and much, much more. Today on the podcast, we talk the 2016 directorial debut from director Tom E. Brown. Brown's films have been featured at the American Museum of Natural History, the Walker Art Center, the Guggenheim, and the Sundance Film Festival. Today's film, Brown's first feature film, titled Pushing Dead, starring James Rodé Rodriguez, Robin Weigert, and Danny Glover, follows a struggling writer sidelining as a poetry slam artist, Bouncer, who also has been HIV positive for the past 20 years and must find a way to get his medication while dealing with a bureaucratic healthcare system, a loony roommate, an old curmu- an old curmu- an old curmudgeon boss, and his constant search for companionship. I'm Gabe Vienendahl, filmmaker, film instructor, and movie enthusiast, and I'm joined as always by veteran podcaster and editor Alan Martindale. Alan, how the hell are you? I'm doing good. I've uh, I've now seen this movie twice. And yeah. it's, I'm not sure it's a movie that anyone needs to see twice, but I have seen it twice. So <laughs> I'm a bona fide expert on pushing dead. I love it. I, we're we're going to get uh, right into it then. Already coming with the blows. Tell me about this impression. <laughs> I, I mean, it's fine and we'll talk about it, but it's it's fine. It's it's not a movie that you really need to see again. It's it's a it's a fun little story. It feels like a personal, a very personal film from the director um so it's i mean it, it it's not bad it's but it's not something that's going to stick with you for a long time either i think well there's a lot of there's a lot of themes going on here and i i like this one already because i think uh this is where we're going to differ we're really going to i think we're going to go toe to toe i'm feeling we Fraser might. ali tonight we might we could do it i'm, I'm feeling Fraser ali uh i love the movie i think it's great um when you when you you know part of the intro of the of the podcast is we we say independent films right and i think this to me in a lot of ways uh is is the epitome of uh of an independent film uh which we'll talk about why that is for me but i you're right i think mean, there's a lot of personal levels to it you that kind of bleeds through the story i think you get that right off the bat and um the reason i chose this particular film was uh, a, we need to stick to our intro. I mean, we should probably stick to first-time directors and indie films as much as we can. But, but also, uh, about three years ago, I guess it would be, I was introduced to this film and I actually met Tom E. Brown. Uh, I spoke with him briefly, just for a brief second, and just told him how much I enjoyed the film. And I saw it at a screening with uh, at a small movie house, a small art house in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, with about 25 people. And so this, and, and it kind of stood out. It was, uh, I was studying my MFA and every year in April and October, I'd go back. It was a low residency program. And you'd go back for about 10 days, every six months, meet with faculty, professors, that kind of thing. And every night during that time you were away, you do screenings, right? And they would bring in filmmakers. This happened to be one of them. And so uh, it kind of left an impression with me, and we'll get into some of those impressions and why I liked it, because uh, it does cover a real kind of plethora of of topics: um, AIDS, healthcare, companionship, relationships. It's comedy, it's drama, it's death, it's life, it's legacy, it's existentialism. I mean, there is a lot to kind of suck in when you watch it. Uh, so, but it stuck out to me, and so I, I liked it, um, and uh, I wanted to rewatch it, and I think that's why I kind of chose it. It's and I don't, I don't really have a problem with it, but it almost feels like there, like you said, there's a lot, there's a lot to to digest and kind of sift through. And I, I think, 
I almost think if it was, which is this is going to sound weird, but I think if it was simplified a little bit more, which is, it might sound strange because it is a pretty simple film. But overall, I think if they if they had not gone gone with a B and a C storyline and not had so many different themes and maybe just kind of focused it a little more and maybe mixed up the characters a little bit because I, I actually watching this, I had a question for you. I'm sitting there watching this and I'm thinking. This is might be the first time I've ever seen a cast that is too likable. And I don't I, I think <laughs> I think it almost the, the film almost suffered for it because they're too close knit. They're too looking out for each other. There are very few flaws in any of these characters. And so for me, it, it's it's almost like I would have liked to seen a little bit more of that. It just it's almost like this utopian world of San Francisco where I'm not sure anybody really resides. Yeah. I mean, I think there's the internal conflict with the main character and sure. I, I'll, we'll, we'll jump, we'll jump into that. And I think, uh, maybe you're just a pessimist. Maybe. I mean, and it could be, it could, I mean, usually, I mean, how many times have you watched a movie and you're like, like nobody in this film is likable and it, it really drags the movie down. This I think is just the opposite. Like it's, it's almost too perfect. It's almost too perfect that I would have liked to seen a little bit more. And obviously there's a lot of struggle in this. I mean, we're, this is a film about HIV and AIDS. Like it's, it's, it's a tough, heavy subject. He does it. He navigates it very well because he keeps it funny and keeps it lighter but uh, at the same time, I would have liked to seen some maybe internal struggle with between the characters uh, rather than yeah. they're all pulling for each other and they're all rooting for each other and yanking each other up. And it's there's nothing wrong with that. But to me, it was it was a little too over the top with that. Yeah, I think uh, the only one you do. I mean, the 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 kind of relationship struggle that you get between characters is with. Uh, with Danny Glover, uh, Bob, his character and his wife, right? Where there is some, it is, there is some, and they, they end up mending it later. But, but even, that's the only... even when you see their conflict, it's almost cute and funny. Like, I don't really yeah, feel like I never once thought, even when she's sitting there and she's saying, I love the man, but I hate him. I really hate him. Like, I never really felt that they disliked each other. And I never really felt at all that I, I was never fearing that they wouldn't get back together. I knew no. that they were going to get back together. No, it never, I agree. It never feels permanent, but the argument that they have is hilarious. I think it's hilarious. Oh, it is. It is like, at, again, at it's very <laughs> light and fun. When he's, uh, when she, when she threatens his, uh, or when he threatens her, uh, her porcelain doll shoves it over the way that it's filmed too. It, we'll get into some of these montages. These montages made me laugh my ass off. Yeah, I mean, it, it, very well done. Very well done. I just, just, I think for me, it's it, the reason it resonates is because it's something. Now I don't have HIV, but I just think the way that they they navigate, like you said, the way he navigates that, and then he, the way he plays relationships, feels like something I would do myself. Do you know what I mean? Like these are this is a movie that I could see myself almost writing and direct. This is the kind of tone that some of the stuff that I, you know what I mean? Uh, like yeah. This is, this, this is in, very much your it's style. In, it's in the wheelhouse is what I mean. Yes. Th this is very much in your wheelhouse. Now that you point that out, I can see that. And I think that's what sticks out. And I think part of that's because the big thing is for me, like you said, we'll talk about it. One of the big things is it, you've, you're dealing with this HIV topic, right? AIDS. So HIV and AIDS. And what I find interesting that I think he does really well, uh, is he removes if you were to remove that as a plot piece right uh and insert any other problem or any other you know perspective i think it's that's what makes it relatable like even though hiv is the the catalyst for his particular problem it still feels relatable across the board even though i don't have hiv it just it's like i could insert whatever my own problem is into that position of hiv and it would feel the same when he is in the pharmacy <laughs> and the and the pharmacist is trying to explain well maybe you should go on the american medical plan premium you know like it is it, that just so captured the the broken system that we have to navigate 
as regular people. And especially like you and I, uh, we've done a lot of independent contract work, which makes it even more infinitely frustrating because you have to navigate that on your own. It's it like there uh, that I was cheering. I'm like, yeah, wait, he nailed it. And then he goes into the insurance office and it's just it feels so relatable because that is a problem millions. so frustrating. Yeah. And then you get well, I don't want to get overly political, but it is a political topic. How many millions of people can relate to that? Right. I, I think ev I think everyone can. Almost everybody. Right. And what I what but he still seems to make it comical because the lady suggests that he gets on the American. He's on American Plus. Maybe he should try American Premium or maybe he should try American Premium Plus. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. And that's exact. <laughs> that's why. These little things to me make it funny because he takes something that's some heavy hitting shit because when you're when you're dealing with that personally, it sucks. Right. But he 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 does it so well. It makes me laugh when I when I watch it. I think um, so I think that relatability, I think anyway, that's why I, we'll get into the storyline here. But that's what kind of draws me in is it feels uh, aside from having the, the personal uh, kind of HIV story to it. I think anyone can relate with their own problem that they could insert into that position. And I like that. And I, I will say he does ramp it up because now it like for most people, I'd say if you don't get your medication, you're going to ha have serious problems, but you most likely aren't going to die. But in this case, it is life and death. If he doesn't get his pills, he's going to die. Right. And so it does make it, you know, there is uh, it is ramped up quite a bit there. And I will also say, Props on Tommy Brown for not going like if this was made in the 90s, this is a much different movie. I think this is yeah. a depressing. I don't know if you can go comedy like in, in the 80s and 90s with this topic, yeah. uh, but he did it. And he, and he he also painted the picture of how HIV is not as big of a deal to the general population as it was back in the 80s. Yeah. He uh, now he is he's he's been living with HIV himself for 30 years. Yeah, it, it, I, I, pro I guess that there was something because it feels very personal. Yeah. And so there's that personal note to it. Um, and and it, the one thing I remember <laughs> at the Q&A that I just I laughed out loud in front of 25 people. And I don't know that I should have, <laughs> but other people might have, too, because it was funny. But I remember I laughed pretty hard and it was a, during the Q&A after this movie. Um, and you know how it is at a Q and A with filmmakers, right? A, a lot of people are going to ask the, uh, the all too obvious question of investors and financing and how'd you do the money and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, he's like, uh, and of course, traditionally he says, that's the hardest part. You know, he says, that was the hardest part. He's like, he said, um, y you know, it was a hard pitch because AIDS comedies seemed to make investors nervous <laughs> and he was joking right he was right funny. right i mean and, uh, i don't i can't imagine there are too many of those so that's that's why it's not funny a lot of yeah. AIDS comedies out there yeah exactly <laughs> uh alan before we get into this storyline too i had you and i think you did watch it i had you watch one of his short films das clown yeah and did i watched it one? again right before uh we jumped on the line here that Short film to me is fantastic. Uh, when I'm watching it, all I can think of is the entire time. I mean, it's a great story. I, I enjoy the story. It's it's like, a, I think, eight minutes long or something like that. Six minutes long. Um, but all I could think was, man, this would be so much fun to make. Like, because <laughs> it's 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 told in in photographs. So yeah. like, like it's presented as if it's a slideshow with a narrator and everything. And I just think I, uh, when I was in school, I did, uh, so, I mean, something similar where it was like, tell a story using only photographs. And it was a film class, obviously. And, um, I did one and I had so much freaking fun doing it. So as I'm watching, uh, this, this short film, Das Clown, I'm just thinking, oh my God, like to have some money behind it and to have a, an evil, an evil puppet thing, little monkey clown whatever it is like and it have some gore effects in there that'd be so much fun i loved it i thought the storyline was hilarious and anytime i mean it, it, it premiered at sundance and so some kind of the simplicity like of this of this little short film 
and it's got an 80s vibe to the idea that it felt like it was like you mentioned a slideshow in my eighth grade classroom right it even had the tone of when you change the slides like yeah. it's, it's so clever yeah uh and so it basically for those listening it's basically a murderous clown uh who ends up then marrying one of his potential victims <laughs> it's, it's hilarious and so, so it, but was it a monkey or was it a clown? I mean, I know it's called Das Clown, but it seemed like at first it was a monkey. And I'm thinking, is that the same monkey from Pushing Dead? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it was the same one. Um, it looked, I guess the best description is a monkey clown. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it, it's kind of a hybrid. It's Anyone cool. listening right now is like monkey clowns. Yeah. Pause it right now. Go look up Das Clown. It's yeah. on Vimeo. I think there's a band called Das Clown. It don't, it's not that. Watch the short film. It's really good. It It's like six minutes long if you don't include the credits. It's great. Go Yeah, you should go watch that one. Be, even before, if you go watch Pushing Dead, I would watch Das Clown first just to kind of, you even even though they're kind of different in their tonality, uh, the way their delivery kind of has similar nuance, mm-hmm. I would say. I would agree. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, let's get into it. So basically, like mentioned in the intro, you have the primary character, also played by James Rodé Rodriguez. I don't know if anybody's a Psych fan, uh, the USA Network television show that ran. Man, that must have, I, I wasn't ever really big into it. I was aware of it and I knew what it was. But that show was pretty popular and it ran for, I don't know, maybe six or seven seasons. Did you ever get into that one? No, I tried to watch it a couple times and it just, it just felt too hokey. It felt too on the nose, I guess. You, you could say, and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't for me. Yeah. I, I never saw it either. I just know a lot of people did like it and it was fairly successful to have run as many uh, seasons as it did. And so the, 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 the star of psych is the, is the lead actor in this pushing dead. He's a struggling writer. He lives in San Francisco. I, I was jokingly saying sidelining is a poetry slam artist. He's a bouncer of a bar, but there's a scene in there where he, it's San Francisco, so it's only appropriate that you do a poetry slam. Yeah, it had uh, it. It really does feel like the coffee shop from "So I Married an Axe Murderer," like in in the modern era, because no one would no one would show up to those things anymore. And he pokes fun of it. I think that's intentional. Is that is that Brown's basically saying, "Hey, uh, they're in they're in this bar, and there's no one there but but his friend." And he's like, anyone, we got any contestants out there tonight? We got any contestants? <laughs> nobody, nobody. And it cuts to a shot and the bar's literally empty. I mean, I think he's 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 jabbing fun at it. Right, right. I think Denny Glover at one point says, no, it's 2015. No one's going to come to this thing. Yeah. Exactly. No one wants a poetry slam. The old man knows the poetry slam's of out of date. <laughs> he's too old for this shit. And we'll get into Danny Glover because I thought he was great. Uh, but he's a struggling writer. Um like we mentioned, has HIV. And the real obstacle in the storyline is like we mentioned him getting uh, him. He's got to take tons and tons of medication, as you would expect, cocktail of medication uh, to stay, uh, um, you know, healthy uh, and not, you know, progress any kind of disease. And he can't get he goes to the, the pharmacy one day and essentially they go, look, you're not covered for the amount that you were covered for before. And now you owe almost $3,000 per month for your medicine. And the reason why I got to jump in because the reason why he no longer qualifies is, is just so typical of the insurance industry because his mom for his birthday, his mom gave him a hundred dollar check. And so he deposited the hundred dollar check. Now he doesn't qualify for the low income insurance plan anymore so and that doesn't mean like they bump up the cost a little bit now he's got to pay three grand out of out of pocket every month for this for, for his right. medicine or he dies because his bank account is now indicating that he's over the the low income status 70 dollars over <laughs> i mean is this not the most typical insurance scam bullshit you've ever heard in your life it's absolutely ridiculous <laughs> it's it's like you said it's so relatable and it's so frustrating um, and, and, and honestly, he's just trying to, he's trying to deposit that check because he's actually going to, he needs the money. He, he like needs you mentioned, it. He's a struggling writer. So, right. <laughs> and he lives in San Francisco, which always goes back to our, our logistics, uh, and the pragmatism of it. <laughs> I thought about we this. talked about this in so I'm very <laughs> I thought about this. <laughs> but how does a struggling writer, 
live in in the heart of the city uh in a decent apartment uh with a hundred dollars in his bank account that i thought about that uh because yeah we did talk about that and so i married an axe murder but yeah it's it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> the only, the only, uh, the only thing that you could say would be that Ra, uh, Paula, played by Robin Weigert, is his roommate, and maybe she's making enough for them to sustain the way through the the apartment rental. Well, and as we know, th- this core group of friends are like the most altruistic people who would do anything for each other, no it's matter true. what. So it would not shock me at all if she's fitting the bill. She, she likely is. And so that that's basically our plot setup is that we have, and then we're following his storyline throughout. We're learning a little bit of exposition. Uh, like you said, we're learning a little bit about the relationships between the friends. Um, he's also uh, in, he, 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 he talks a lot about uh, death and he kind of has like in life, but also like talks about his legacy. There's a scene in there where, he's giving a little bit of voiceover narration about a particular um, experience with his grandpa. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, there's so much, there's so much like the self-reflection. There's so much of that kind of stuff in here that I feel like I'm not, I'm missing the point of all of them. Cause I don't understand the point of that story. I, I mean, other well, than other me, than when he says, you know, how people are going to remember me, uh, and that's kind of the I don't want to call it the punchline. That's the point, but it's it's a weird it's a weirdly intricate and detailed story that doesn't really have anything to. I mean, I think I think there could have been other ways to do that. I think. Well, see, I, I, this is where we're gonna let's put on the gloves. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Come on, we're due, up, man. man. We're due for a good fight. We are, because I love it. See the the subtleness of it is 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 great to me. I mean, that's the one thing that he remembers his grandpa by, right? And it's basically this old car that he that he remembers the smell of the car and those things brought back how how kind of nice and and polite and and kind of the the type of character that his grandpa was. And <clears throat> That's the thing that he remembers most is that smell of his car. He says, I forget about my grandpa all the time. I don't really remember, but every once in a while I'll get in a car and it has a faint hint of that same smell. And it reminds me of him. And uh, so for me, it's the little subtle things. And it's really, it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's existential in the sense that it's about life and death, but it's also kind of legacy. You know what I mean? Like, what's the legacy you leave behind? What is, what's the thing once you're gone? You know, I'm not going to get over, I don't want to get overly philosophical, but once you, once you go, what's that legacy you leave behind? And I like it. It's that subtle little story. You know? I like it so. too. And, and I, I understand the point of it. And I also understand that kind of the urge, it brings the, the story a little bit more urgency because he can't get his medication. I just don't know. And maybe I'll maybe I'll remember as as we're going through it. I don't remember this theme being prominent throughout the rest of it. Like if you get, I, I understand the importance of legacy, and this is what I say when I when I this is what I mean when I say there's so many different themes and so many different things going on in this movie that I think if you, if they could have focused like on legacy, like what am I going to leave behind, do that, or or what does it mean to be in a relationship, or. Or what does it mean to be living with HIV for this long? You know, something, but it feels like there's, he, he's trying to explore so many, so many different themes. And I understand if you're living with HIV or any sort of deadly illness, I imagine that's probably going to go through your head. I'm just not sure you can capture it in a two hour movie. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are pieces to it because you have so much that it can, it can, it can become a little bit convoluted. Uh, and, and I, and I get that. Um, I think, you know, he does kind of go into a little bit of the exposition because I think he is in that constant search for companionship. And, and he's like, he, whatever that means, he's looking for something, you know, uh, a partner, someone to, to share whatever life with. Um, he gets into that a little bit. And he does go into that exposition of the person that his partner, right, that died. 
from which I, if I remember right, I assume it was HIV or AIDS. I think so. Um, and here's what I think he does brilliantly. Okay. Is once again, playing the balance between really serious shit and comedy. Yes. That's a hard, that's a hard line to play. I think it's a hard line to play or at least play effectively. Um, and here's, here's a, uh, an example of one. And I want to see what you think about this, these, uh, these scenes. He is talking to Paula. Paula's his roommate. They're at, they're at a restaurant having dinner. She's trying to pull out. He's, he's pretty closed off mostly in the sense that he doesn't want to talk about, you know, the AIDS or about Kevin. Kevin was his partner who, who died. But he ends up opening up a little bit and he starts telling her <laughs> about a dream that he had. And at first, it starts to feel a little bit sentimental, right? And he starts talking about how he had a dream about Kevin. And it starts to get real kind of nice and, and, and like I said, sentimental. And then <laughs> the dream evolves into the obscure. And the next thing you know is that in the dream, Kevin is with him. But Kevin, in, Kevin is feeding him strawberries with a crab hand. <laughs> and it's totally normal because it's a dream. Like he doesn't and he react. he just went with it. He's yeah. like, I just went with it. It was fine. I just like, but, but you're thinking about it, right? If you're really to take it in context and go, okay, somebody had HIV. Their partner died of AIDS. They now have HIV as well. They're dealing with it in and out. I mean, that's all pretty, if you think that's pretty dark, heavy shit. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's and, and it would have been easy to really go overly sappy at that moment. That's what I mean. You could go real deep and layered into that darkness, so to speak. And I love that he brings the levity back and with a crab hand in a dream and the, the eccentric nature of and it's I think it's filmed well. It makes me laugh. There's a little, you know, feeding him strawberries. So the reason I bring that up is because I think he balances that out really well uh with with the comedy and the drama yeah i know i i think without a doubt he he's ve he's very skilled at balancing those two things because i mean it would it would have been easy to go the other way too, go too much comedy and then you lose the emotion and you you lose the the punch of the film here's where i got lost because up to this point i've basically been uh, applauding tommy brown and i actually do like this film a lot but here's where it got, you were talking about this convolution, right? Where you got this storyline, this storyline, this storyline. So we have the storyline of, of our main character, you know, Dan, who's basically trying to find a way to get his medication or, or stay healthy, quote unquote. And also simultaneously kind of maybe look for some kind of partnership or, or relationship. And that's kind of the, we'd say that's like the main storyline, right? <clears throat> on the side of that, you have his roommate and we'll get into her in just a minute. And there's a little bit of a, a side story there with her. And then you have another side story with uh, Danny Glover's character, Bob and his wife. And then you bring in a little bit of a, of a, a very small side story where Dan actually, you know, actually finds a guy that he likes and then that kind of dissolves. And so there's all these little things going on, but here's, those don't bother me too much. I can kind of see those seem like a natural life progression where you're just kind of balancing out different relationships. What, where I got, I want to get your opinion on the, <clears throat> the intercut scenes and the random optimistic child with the pithy expressions. So the every, there, like three or four times throughout the film, there be, there's a child there who gives the old time sayings, like things that we're, we've all heard a hundred times. And she randomly appears throughout the, the movie. Now the, the kid is absolutely darling, cute kid, but just that's where I, that's the one point in, in, in the movie that I was like, no, we could take that out. See, I disagree for me. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why for me, I love like pithy expressions. I, well, I do. I do like pithy expressions, but her interaction, her fir the first time she appears is with Danny Glover. 
when they're sitting on the bench. And that interaction <laughs> between Danny Glover and her is hilarious because uh, she I can't remember what she says. She gives him some sort of fortune. And, and then she says, do, do you want me to read your fortune or do you want me to tell you your future? And she goes, do you want me to tell you your death date? And the, the look that Danny Glover gives her and he just goes, Jesus Christ, it, it's it, it's delivered so perfectly. And that's what I'm like. OK, now I kind of get what we're playing with here. I think I think if you don't have Danny Glover, if that's not the first interaction, I think I'm with you. I'm like, what? I don't understand this and I'm not following it. But the fact that, that she does that is, is hilarious with him. That I agree with because I think and we'll get into now. We might as well jump into Danny Glover because I think he's hilarious in this. Oh, movie. he's great. He's great. Um, the only thing with that is that she's got a little bit of Damien from the Omen vibe where she, this is what I mean. It doesn't fit into the style or the tone of the movie for me. Um, as cute as she is, it just seems awkward and happenstance that she arrives, but Danny Glover's reaction is great. <laughs> and he's got one liners just melted all the way through this, this film. He's so goddamn funny. I, I mean, he's just to be like, I don't know. Have you seen saw? Yeah. The original. Okay. He's in that. And that was, I want to say in like 99 or 2000. And he was old in that. Like he, you know, he was like old and tired in that. And now you add another 20 years onto that. Like he's, he's really old now, but for him to be that old and, and he still got that weird, charming, comedic straight man, uh, aura about him. And he just plays everything so well. When uh, I mean, when I read off curmudgeon as a boss, that that's a that's the that is literally that's the definition him. of his character. There's a scene in there where, after he gets in a fight with his wife, Dan invites him to stay at his house for a night, and they end up watching a a blind date show, and they're like, "Can we change this show?" And he's like, "No, this is the best." He, no, he said, "This is the real shit here." This is the real shit. Yeah. <laughs> This is the real shit. <laughs> so I, you know, Danny Glover's great in this. Um, if you look at what, and that that kind of led me to my question for you, which was like, what character kind of stood out? What one did you really uh, enjoy most out of all of them? And it sounds like that's probably the one. Oh, hands down. I mean, th hands down, Danny Glover. But I, I do think again, I think all the characters are well written uh even though they're all you know they don't have flaws even danny glover he's like the most flawed character and even when his flaws like that he's an old grumpy man but even with him it's cute like it's charming no, that i agree with i mean they're polished right they're very polished but yeah. but a lot of the time when when, it, when characters are too unlikable or too likable they're all kind of written the same so he's done a very good job at making these characters overly likable but they're all very unique and i actually really enjoy all of them every single one of them uh but i would say danny glover i think stands out the most as uh we we progress through it i mean i'm not gonna walk through this particular one storyline by storyline because we've already kind of identified what the plot is and now we're just following dan's life throughout this mess as he's trying to figure everything out and these uh is there a scene that stands out that you uh either really hated or really enjoyed uh okay not i'm not so sure i'd have to think about it but for me the first thing that stood out to me is it's like it, it's as if dan is living in the 80s even though it's 2015 because he <laughs> is like even when he goes into the uh like he goes into the insurance office first of all who who does that who doesn't just get on the phone or online and deal with him <laughs> he uses an atm like who who does who everyone just deposits checks with their phone right like very few people actually go to the ATM to deposit a check he's got a landline that he can literally rip out of the wall who even has a landline anymore and if you do have a landline it probably came with your your high speed internet that you have for free <laughs> so i mean that that kind of stood out to me also uh his coffee addiction was making me jittery <laughs> I don't know if you've ever drink like drink too much coffee or caffeine. It's it's the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. And I don't know if you've ever been addicted to caffeine, but it sucks. Um 
So, I, I mean, there's not really, they're just kind of character quirks. That... Never, never addicted to caffeine. <laughs> what do you drink? What is that now? What are you drinking now? That's a, it's a sparkling water, <clears throat> but it has caffeine. <laughs> yeah, in. yeah. I used to drink like four rock stars a day. It was horrible. <laughs> yeah. Like it, 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 when I was in high school, it was terrible. Like those things are so bad for you. Horrible. As it is. I'll have a, an energy drink once in a while if I'm, but uh, they're horrible for you. Oh, I drink an energy drink now and I, I feel sick to my stomach. How they're, do you drink four in a day? You build up to it, man. You just build up to it. How did your heart not explode? I was, I was a young buck back then. I was like 18 <laughs> years old. I could handle it. Nowadays, no. Like I, I have one and a, I, I feel like I'm going to die. I can't drink if, those if, things anymore. If you have four of those, you'll be pushing dead yourself. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> I mean, I because I, I can drink coffee. I used to drink a lot of coffee too. I used to be able to drink coffee up until I went to bed, no problem. But now, like now, it's like one cup in the morning, and that's it. So seeing him just constantly and not he's not eating. He doesn't eat anything really in, in, throughout the whole well, movie. Well, this becomes a plot point too. When he takes all the meds, he can't eat. There's something that makes him nauseated or sick, or it doesn't. The it's not as potent if he eats or something. I don't know. And that becomes a plot point because at the beginning of the film, we, I think that scene at the beginning cracks me up though. And just all you see is a, is a, is a Bronco or an old car truck, just cruising through the city, just blazing down the streets. And Dan's in the back, just in, in aggregating, he's just in excruciating pain uh, as, as Paul is driving him to the hospital. It's a great Uh, hook to start the movie for sure. It's a great way to start the movie. I always love when movies start out with punches and yeah. it's not that slow, methodical build, but like right into it. Um, but that is, a, and you were mentioning this before, like he drinks a lot of coffee, <laughs> like a lot of coffee. Um, he doesn't eat uh, primarily because he, which, which that's the other plot point I have a little curiosity about. And I wouldn't know because I don't take that many meds. I, I thought you were like supposed to eat with certain I think, I mean, it, most medicine that I've seen you do, but I don't know if the, these are, and again, this feels like a personal film. So I would imagine Tommy Brown probably knows this very well that, yeah. um, so I, I mean, yeah, I would think, I would think he'd want to eat, but it, it just, there, there are a couple scenes that really illustrate his character when he can't afford to buy food and coffee. So he always, he always ends up buying the coffee, which by the way, that scene in the beginning after he gets denied on the medical on the insurance and he's in the pharmacy it's one of those kind of cvs stores or whatever they are and he goes over to get a a loaf of bread and something and then some the coffee and uh that's um, that's relatable too The, the where you go up to the cashier and they go 22 11 and then you put your card in and it doesn't clear so it's the worst it's the worst feeling in the world. <laughs> what do you do in those instances? Well, it's happened to me before. I just go, oh, you know, I got another card in my uh, car outside. And I yeah. just walk out. <laughs> yeah, I've done that too. I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> Literally just walk away. Uh, how embarrassing is that? Or when you, I've done it where I've gone into a Target <laughs> and it didn't clear. The debit card didn't clear. And I, and I had like a bag of stuff and I just walked away. <laughs> Oh, I've, I've done that. It happened to me one time at Target uh, at Christmas time. I'm out of here. And I think I grabbed like the wrong card or something. I'm going to go with that. Who knows? I was probably poor, but I'm just going to say that. And I had like all the Christmas presents for the kids and the lines were super long. And I get up to the front after waiting forever. And yeah, it doesn't decline. So then, yeah, you just you walk out, man. That's all you can do at that point. You do the shoulder <laughs> glance, though, because you want to make sure that, you know, who's behind you that you just like. It's so embarrassing. There's a line of people behind you and you just kind of (laughs) gently look over your shoulder and then slyly turn to your left and walk. Yeah, that's what you do. (laughs) We're pros at this. It's relatable in that sense. I mean, everything that uh, when it comes to finances or finances, he um, I think, he, he, you know, he, he, he makes it relatable for anybody who's gone through those kind of situations. Okay, I can't get bread. I guess I'll have a 99 cent cup of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> he. I mean, and that, that's his character to a T. I mean, he, he goes to a diner in the middle of the night with his roommate and he doesn't he feels pressure to order food, but he doesn't want the food. He just wants the coffee. And then he complains that the coffee's too weak and it's the middle of the night. 
Yeah, he's all over the map on that scene. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> Uh, one thing I did like about uh, that was the atmosphere. Um, I like there's kind of an authenticity, you know, to to the city. Uh, I've been to San Francisco a few times, and I just like and and I know now more than ever even. Um, it, so it's easy to build the city into this kind of glorious uh, city by the bay. You know, if uh, you're a tourist, it's e- it's easy that you you only see those parts essentially, right? And I like that he, in this particular atmosphere and how he builds the environment, there's kind of an authenticity. It's the exact opposite. It's not the tourist vibe. Right, right. Uh, you, you did ask about scenes that stuck out to me. I'll tell you one scene that I really enjoyed, and that's when he finds the monkey. That's what, that's what I was going to get to. Okay, okay. No, no, you're, I'll, I'll let you go. But in that scene where he's walking home or walking back, you know, you see homeless people. You see a guy lying on the street. And that brings some of the authenticity, the unfortunate reality of the city of right. San Francisco and really any big city, uh, particularly in California. But um, while he's there, he, he runs across to, I guess it's a, what do they call those? A, a, a yard sale, or I guess it's not a yard sale there, but uh, garage a, sale or something. Garage or, sale, yeah. state sale. Yeah. And he's walking by and he sees, the monkey it's this white monkey uh hanneman hanneman that's the name the great monkey warrior (laughs) and it's just this little stuffed monkey but i love how the guy who's selling it talks it up the great monkey warrior he's a rare he's a special one that one he's rare he's super rare and admittedly this thing is creepy looking it is it's super creepy because it has human features it's got kind of humanistic features, fingers that feel like human fingers. It's weird. You know? It's very weird. Um, I guess one thing I will say, I kind of liked the 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 character development that plays out through the monkey with the uh, the roommate, because she she obviously is a timid, scared person. She's scared of the city. She's scared to walk alone. She's scared to to have the door even left unlocked when they're home. Uh, she's she's terrified and she she kind of expects the worst out of people and so dan gives her this monkey and initially she's terrified of it she covers she she puts a blanket over it so she can't see it but little by little as she gets to uh be used to the monkey and starts to love the monkey and treat the monkey like it's a pet or a child or something she comes out of her shell and she gets more confident and she takes self-defense classes and she kicks the shit out of a mugger and and i i liked that little character growth it 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 felt a little tacked on but i did like seeing it happen yeah i i agree i I, it made me laugh i mean let's let's also say that um it it's a good it's a good mcguffin it's a good Mm -hmm. uh plot point that like you said builds her character uh kind of pushes her into gaining a little more confidence i want to know how much dan paid for it though yeah, I did like that line where he's how much you want. He says twenty five bucks, and he says, "Would you take less?" Less, <laughs> and then it just cuts away. Wallet. Yeah, yeah. It was, I thought that was that was well written. I like that. So, a lot of good things going here. I mean, for me, um, there's there's a couple. I, I love a lot of the montages that he does. Um, I like comedic stops in narrative. In other words, like. The, the story's trajecting and then you can stop it and give a little exposition through montage. Mm-hmm. There's a scene in there where he's talking about how he's a, he goes on a date with this guy, which by the way, he's been pursuing uh, a little bit throughout the film. And he's very, in his own way, shy. Dan uh, sees this guy that he's attracted to and he's a little bit shy about uh, kind of asking him out. He ends up getting, going on a date with him. And the guy asks him what he does. And he's like, I'm a writer and I'm a bouncer. And he's like, have you ever gotten a fight? And <laughs> instead of this is, these are the little things that I like. And there's two scenes that I'll share. These are, I think this is what uh, really kind of uh, sharp, concise storytelling is about, which is you don't have to explain it away. Well, well have I been a bouncer? We just cut to a bunch of images of Dan getting in the middle of a fight at the bar 
and basically getting his ass kicked in in like three or four different instances. <laughs> you know, he's there's one instance where he jump, he gets hit, and then he jumps back into frame, and he's all bloody, and he's like, you know, and the way that's done is great too, because I love it, because he's he's obviously he's starting to say to the guy, I don't want to fight, I don't want, and he's like, I don't want it, and the guy just sucker punches him, and then he comes up bloody. It's great. And and those are like those little concise like that's what those little concise because he does it again at the beginning of the film with Paula Dan's at the bar he's just discovered that his insurance is gone and she comes to the bar and starts telling him about this story but instead of her just dialoguing it right and going we just hear her say it it cuts to the actual sequence of events and it ends up being a woman on the top of a building throwing batteries at her i i liked that i don't i know why like what i mean why what is why the point? Not? what is but what is the point i mean there's so much in this movie already it's already too long i i, I will say that i think it's too long it kind of drags well, here you for... go i'm ready to give you a taste of your own medicine you ready to hear this out <laughs> let's hear it <laughs> you said not too long ago that paula lacked in confidence well so if someone was throwing batteries at me and i was quote unquote weak or uh felt inadequate to confront that person i would run away and i would tell the story to someone else i wouldn't uh, but if i was confident i might go after that person all right i might like confront that individual right so i think what i'm getting at is this is a way to show her vulnerabilities, right? She's not a confrontational person. Let's be honest. I'll be honest. If someone threw batteries at me, I'm confronting them. I hear you. I hear right? you. Um, so he's saying this is not a confrontational character. I hear you. And I, I agree. I think you have to show that in order to show the character growth. But and it's funny. It is funny. But it is so obscure that I feel like I want an answer. I feel like I want more. And obviously this must be something I'm assuming here that, that Tom E. Brown either experienced or someone he knows experienced. But for me to put it in a film, that's something that's so obscure. I got to know, I got to know what's going on there. Why are you throwing D batteries? Those are expensive, by the way. Let me ask you a question. Are you a poker player? No. Okay. I'm not. I've, I've tried. I'm terrible. Yeah, I'm not good either. I just, the reason I say that is you want all the cards laid out. I do. I want to know what the other guy's holding at the end of the hand. I do. If you I just got beat, know. I want to know if he's bluffing or not. You're not, you're not ever satisfied with not knowing. There, right? Look, there, there are some films where I think you can get away with doing something like that, like something wacky and quirky. But for me, like it would have been nice if she would have went back and confronted that woman, that that specific woman, face that challenge, and then we figure out maybe a little bit more, or seen her like face that that specific incident. But instead, like I, I just don't. Why add something so quirky if you're gonna not follow through on it? In in this, I got you. It, it's kind of it, it. This is my version of that little girl. You know, like you weren't real happy with the little girl because it. it and I assume you meant because it, it kind of tonally doesn't fit. Is that right? It totally doesn't fit. And I, and this is the, where I'm, I'm agreeing with you in the sense that there's so many convoluted plot devices going on. We don't need an extra one. Right. We're already, we're already understanding death, life, relationships, companionships. We don't need that extra in, incentive to try to get our brains wrapped around what's going on with these people, you know? The okay. little, the, the little on the nose, uh, one liners that, that say exactly what he's already described through the story. Before. Okay. I, I see what you're saying. Um, okay. Well, th this was just an incident with me to me. It's very, it's interesting that someone's throwing D batteries at a random person on the street. That's interesting. And I want to, I want to explore that. I want to know what the hell's going on there instead of just I leaving okay it, never with addressing it with it ending because it made me laugh my ass off when she was telling the story. And then she's like, some, I can't remember the exact dialogue where she says something about feeling a, a striking pain in her middle of her back or something. <laughs> yeah. And it shows this, you got to appreciate the sound effect at least, which is the, the old cliched, 
long elongated scream that's kind of stretched out yeah. in a in a deep pitch. <laughs> well, I, it's, know, I, I mean, it's it. very it's it's very well done, and I do think it's funny. To me, I just I want to. That's interesting. Let's let's a, let's find out what happened there. Instead, of, what just it's just weird that they throw that in there. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Tell me. Uh, okay, look. Dan goes through this whole ordeal, basically. Also, uh, like you say, we see a little character development in Paula. Dan helps her get through that using the uh, Hanuman, the great warrior monkey, or the great monkey warrior. (laughs) Um, So we see the little character development in her. Um, Where do we see any, what's Dan's development, or how does he grow as a character from from the beginning to the end? Do you see anything there? No, and and this is and I, I imagine you probably read more into it and, and saw more than I did. Uh, to me, this is kind of my problem with him being so so likable to begin with. Like the, there aren't many flaws, so there's not many things to correct. He there was a, there was a problem that needed to be solved, and we'll talk about when it gets solved. To me, that also felt like wrapping it up in a nice little bow, a little little too easily. But there was a problem that needed to be solved. It got solved. I'm not sure how much growth was done for Dan from the beginning towards the end. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably a lot more subtle in Dan's case. I mean, we definitely see a lot of strong growth in Paula's character. I also think we see a, a slight bit of growth, at least, at least some kind of resolution between Bob and Dot. Bob is Danny Glover and Dot is his wife. There's a little character uh, arc there where the both of them, uh, make amends and, and and like you said, we kind of anticipated that, right? We kind I, of knew that. I even see a little bit of arc in both Bob and Dot actually, because Bob, you see at the end, he's able to uh, maybe like stop himself from being an old curmudgeon. How long that's going to last, we don't know. But there's a moment there where he he almost starts again and he kind of stops himself. And I think uh, Dot needed to let Bob know that she that he can't push her around. And I yeah. think she that's something she did by by leaving for for a little bit. Yeah, I think the the character growth is there for them. So here's where I think I saw a little takeaway of growth for Dan was in the beginning like for me he he you you see a lot of like his desire to want to build or find a companionship. He lost Kevin and he kind of feels like hey, I need he's kind of yearning, you know, if you're in a relationship for a long time, there's a good possibility that if that person leaves or or passes on that uh, there's an emptiness. I think part of it for Dan is he's trying to fill that. And I think the character growth for me at least is uh, even as he goes out and he starts dating this guy, he kind of throws himself out there at this guy. And then he finds out that this guy isn't the person that he wanted or thought he was. And it really implodes. Right. And the reason it implodes is because the guy, uh, didn't like the fact that Dan had been HIV positive for 20 plus years. Which is, is strange. Maybe I just don't but understand. It's strange to me too. I agree. But it might, it might be a thing. I, and it, I mean, the Once only again, thing... I think Tommy, he's speaking something from experience here in the sense that maybe that's something that's in that community where, hey, you know, the, the longevity of it is a strange thing. I don't know why, but maybe it is. Uh, the first time I watched it, I, I just kept thinking, I think the guy's name is Mike, I want to say. Um, I, I, I just thought Mike's a dick. Like that's, I don't understand. They're both HIV positive. What's the, what's the problem? But the second time I watched it, I was was kind of trying to give Mike the benefit of the doubt. Maybe because Dan does, does say that his life expectancy is, is lower. Maybe Mike's just worried that Dan's going to die soon or, or sooner than he would like. And maybe, maybe he's just running from that fact. I don't know. But no, that could, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think of it that way. Maybe there's that possibility where he just doesn't want to get into something thinking, Hey, this time is shorter. Right. Right. That That's the only, that's the only trying to give him the, the biggest benefit of the doubt. That's the only thing I could think of. Yeah. Cause otherwise I agree with you. If I look at it from a different perspective, I'm going, Mike's a real dick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because they obviously have a connection. Like that was a, a charming scene when they were together. Like it was, they played off each other. It was good chemistry and, to just up and bail like that. I was like, that's, that's weak, man. You can't do that. But Mike does bring a, uh, a plot device into the story besides just a, a character build. And this goes back to, or not a character build, a, 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 a transition or a kind of narrative arc. 
here's where <laughs> this is what I thought was funny. And I, this is where I think Dan uh, does grow a little bit. We see that arc. Uh, when Dan uh, finds out that Mike doesn't want anything to do with him, uh, he's he's kind of devastated, right? He basically tries to to, to 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 call it overdose and do all that kind of stuff. Or, but before that, what I find this is what I love the little you, you probably don't love them, but I love them, which is these absurd random acts. Which is when they're on a date, Dan starts telling Mike about a dream that he has. <laughs> Again, yeah, we already talked about the dream with Kevin having a lobster hand, but now there's a dream that he has of a puppet uh, that has like bleeding eyes. Which, I mean, it's cool. I just don't, I, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know why. I, I think, I think cause we, we, I think we had this discussion once before. I'm a huge dreamer. In other words, when I go to bed, I dream almost every night. Do, and I can't remember what you're, do you dream? I, I kind of go through spurts where I'll dream like for, for like a month straight, I'll have crazy vivid dreams that I remember. I and then say, a month, I, they... and then a month off and then, back on because there's sometimes there's dreams where they feel real like it just feels like a real event in life and then other times there's these really obscure happenings yeah mine mine tend to be the more obscure type type yeah mine do too and that's why i think this is funny because he has this recurring almost dream of this very scary looking puppet thing that's dressed and has black eyes which in a lot of ways to me at least resembles death right uh, and I think he's even over a coffin or it looks like he is, but he's got bleeding eyes and he's got a suit on almost like a, if you're visiting a few or going to a funeral or something. But anyway, he's, <laughs> he has this dream and he tells Mike about it. And then later in the story, Mike dumps him. But what I loved is Dan left him a little present. This is what I liked about his this art is cool. was, uh, it shows, uh, They've now separated. They're not together. They're not even having anything to do with each other. But Mike is sleeping in his bed and he wakes up in sweat at the end of the film, near the end of the film. And, and then it cut and it cuts to him. He was having a dream of this scary looking puppet with bleeding eyes and dark and black, black eyes. It just, and the way that it's filmed is creepy. It and, is. And it, the, the puppet actually, or the, yeah, it actually kind of looks like Dan too. And it looks like Dan a little, a little bit, bit like and, him. And and I gotta say that puppet kicks ass in terms of the production value, the way they built it, the way they made it. I think it's for an indie film once again that you have a, ve- a relatively limited budget. Some of that shit that's the artistic little hints that you when you're doing prop builds and things like that. Uh, I, I loved it. And he left basically leaves Mike a present. Uh, now Mike is dreaming in the same this this same <laughs> creepy dream that Dan always had. <laughs> yeah, no, I loved it. I thought it was I, I I thought it was great. I just it's just a weird thing to tell a date, man. Like a first date, it's just it, it's just one more thing that just kind of added on. Like I love these elements. I think they're great. It's just there's too many cool elements. It's it's just like trying to fit too much stuff into one film. Yeah, you got overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In not, a way. not from the sense of the story. I mean, right, you understand right. it wasn't complex, but right. there's so much. I don't know what that, to make of it. Right. It's a lot of, it's a lot to, 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 yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to say it. I, cause I see what you're saying. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to find the words too, but it feels like I, there's something interesting that happens and I try and figure it out what it is, but before I can even get my head around it, something else that's interesting happens and then something else that's interesting happens. And it, it's like, it's almost like too many good ideas tried to shoehorn in there at once. Here's, I think you just nailed it for me. Uh, I, I still love the, the movie. I really do. But I think, I, and I get the angle you're coming in on. So we don't have a ton of blows other than there's so many, that's, that's, I think a good point, which is there's, so much going on in terms of topics that could be covered and also the way that he does them. So if I read through that list again, I made one. You got AIDS, healthcare, companionship, relationships, comedy, drama, death, life, legacy, existentialism, monkey warrior dolls, pithy child expressions, scary puppets with bloody eyes, crab hands. Like we could go on and on and on. It's it's the greatest form of writing. If I was to, that's why I think I like it. Cause if I'm writing a feature, I'm going to make a list of just weird shit all the way down. 
Well, and for sure. Here's the selection is you got to be, how do I pick pickpocket the best pieces to put them into the story? And I don't maybe need everything. And I'm not saying Tommy Brown has everything. I just mean, I think he's got so many cool concepts in his head that it's hard yes. to narrow them down. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I think he needs to make many films. You know, exactly. I, this is I want to see more. Right. Uh, and, and take pieces of these and put like, yeah, so it doesn't feel as convoluted into one film. And you know what? It could be that, I, look, we've talked about this so many times. You know, we're both filmmakers. Making movies is freaking hard, man. It's hard. And especially when you're trying to raise money and then you got to you gotta make money back from the investors. Like, he may have just not been positive he's going to get a second chance, especially, as he said in that, in that Q&A, uh, when you make a movie about an AIDS, an AIDS comedy, it's not going to, you know, I can't imagine there's a wide audience for this. It makes investors nervous. It makes investors nervous. And I can't imagine you're going to make back a ton of money. So maybe, you know, and, and if you can't make a lot of money in your first feature, they're going to be more nervous to give you money for the next feature. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And so maybe he's just trying to throw it all in there because he knows. I mean, he's an older gentleman. And by older, I just, I don't know his exact age, but. Um, well, I think uh, Doss yeah. Clown was 1999 or something, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. He had done some stuff before then, too. And and so he's been making films for 30 years. Um. And so he's an older guy and maybe this is <laughs> like, I got one shot potentially here because it's so hard to make a film. I'm going to throw everything I can into this one. Yeah. I mean, he made Doss Clown in 99. He had one more short after that and then Pushing Dead in 2016. Yeah. So that's, it may be, maybe he's been working on this because it does feel like uh, almost a passion project. Like I said, it feels very personal. So maybe this is something very he's personal. been trying to make for a long time. You know, that's that's really it. I mean, I have some things I want to cover in the summary of it um, and, and, and kind of give not only my rating, but also my recommendation. Um, give me give me yours, Alan, uh, in terms of a summary overall. Uh, is this a filmmaker that you're interested in? Is uh, is this a rewatchable? Those kind of things. And then throw in that rating. Definitely a filmmaker I'm interested in. I would love to see what else he can do. Uh, it feels like he, th this feels like something, and this is totally my, my perception. It feels like something that he needed to make for him. Uh, I want to see, I want to see what he can do after this. I want to see how he can follow it up. Um, so I'm definitely interested. He's immensely skilled, talented writer, talented director. I, the, the elements are, are, are there without a doubt. I'm just, this movie's just, it's not really for me. Uh, I love the comedy elements. I love that he didn't make it too serious. I love that he didn't make it too funny. Like he, he, he like we talked about, he's really good at, at getting that balance between comedy and and serious in something that's it's pretty dark and pretty heavy. Um, it's just to me, it, there's nothing here that makes me really want to rewatch it. It's it's something that I'll be like, yeah, that's that's a cool that's a cool story. It was a cool movie, and and I can't remember the the, the actor's name, Dan, whoever played Dan. Um, let me look it up here. Uh, oh, it's James Rodé Rodriguez. Yeah. Okay, and and I'm sure it w the next thing I see him in, I'll be like, oh, he was in that 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 AIDS comedy. You know, I I won't remember him from Psych. <laughs> I'll remember him from this, and that's about what I'll remember for this movie. So, I mean, it's good. I think you should watch it if you're if you're interested in seeing a lot of cool ideas and what could be done. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, don't go out of your way. I think it's on Prime, so you can watch it for free. Uh, yeah. But I'm gonna give my rating and. I'm going to give it 6.5 Swissums, which is those little Swiss crackers that Dot wanted to buy that Danny Glover was not having any of. <laughs> which is a great uh, catalyst for their uh, character arc because she she kind of shows him that scene too. You were talking about uh, uh, Dot being able to kind of stand up to Bob. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that She does there. He says, we don't need those. And she throws two boxes in the cart. <laughs> Yeah. You know what? I, one thing I do want to say before we go is is how the problem got solved at the end, I think was a little convenient for me. So uh, at, at the end, so the insurance agent that Dan was was dealing with, um, he he is uh, he's trans at night, like he goes out at night and he's wearing women's clothing and he he falls on he's drunk and he falls on some uh, he falls on his heels. And so Dan carries him to the hospital 
And we don't know it's him until later on when we find out that uh, his insurance goes through because we see the insurance agent shredding the uh, the uh, the paperwork, the the bank statement, uh, basically erasing the evidence that he's seventy dollars over and, and he helping get his him out. insurance back. Yeah, I, I I like how they wrapped it up, but I also still think it was a little too convenient. It was just. It's just one more thing where like everything's going to be great for these great people in this great community that we live in. So yeah, it all, it all does end out in a nice, uh, uh, wrapped bow, you know, where not only that happens, but also like we alluded to before, uh, Dan kind of goes over the top on his meds and then it gets him real sick. And then we revisit the 10 days earlier, which was him driving to the, or, um, Paula driving him to the hospital and he makes he's going to make a recovery and he'll be OK. And it all kind of gets wrapped up nicely. Yeah, it's it's just a little too. I don't know. It's just it was a little too convenient for me. I mean, I obviously, want- I like it better than than Dan dying. I do want to say that because that seems like <laughs> to be the only other alternative for this Alan ending. Wants hardship. But I know I don't like I, I've said many times I don't like depressing movies. That's why I have a hard time with Clint Eastwood films. But uh, for me, it was just a little convenient. That's all. I mean, Mike gets his, and that's my favorite part. Yeah, that uh, that's great. I mean, that's a, that's the best ending. So no, I'm with you. I think I think uh, you know there's some disagreement there in terms of uh, the rewatchability of it. I feel like I could rewatch it. Um, this wouldn't be one I would. You know, there's certain movie. There, there's levels to rewatchability as well, though. So uh, as silly as it sounds, you can rewatch freaking talladega nights 20 times because it's just so dumb and you can laugh <laughs> right you know what i mean yeah. it's not that kind of rewatchability uh but if i was to let's say this if, if 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 someone hadn't seen it a friend or a family member and they're like hey let's watch a movie uh this would be on a suggestion list i would rewatch it in those cases uh, and i would probably enjoy it so i really like the film um really like tommy brown uh, primarily because I, I, I'm a little, uh, I like the, the concept of being, uh, a little bit, you know, uh, happy and, and like it, it kind of just ends nicely tied up. Uh, I'm okay with that. Some, what's funny is I'm probably more so than you. I actually like, usually I like the dark shit, uh, where it's like, uh, there's a, there's, you know, something happens and, and, uh, it's not always the, the happiest of endings but in this particular case i really uh i really enjoyed it um i think if i was to put my rating on this i'm gonna go uh well let me give let me there's not a whole lot of trivia uh the only trivia that i have uh is kind of what i shared earlier uh, just with his kind of approach to, to making the film and then his short films and some of his other work. Um, Cause there's not a whole lot there uh, other than it's very difficult to make a feature film. And I applaud him for that and making one that's well done. I do agree with you potentially on kind of the convolution of it. I can see all the great uh, topics and conversations that you could have in this film and what it, what it's about. And, and um, I'm going to go with, Uh, I would recommend it uh, for those. I'm going to go a little different direction than you. I would recommend it. And I would say uh, I'm going to go with a 7.1 Great Monkey Warriors. Yes, I'm so glad. I left left that for you because I figured you want to go with that guy. I appreciate that. I... uh, Otherwise, we would have been here for 30 seconds just while I was trying (laughs) to figure one out. (laughs) But we're not that far off. No, we're not really. Like the reason I feel like I probably came in a little low. It's one of those things where we do where I do this every time. I should probably give him a few more points for uh, it being an independent film and and just the the sheer idea of making a movie that's yeah. yours. Yeah, and not doing it under the guise of a big studio and just trying to hodge in quote unquote hodgepodge it together. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, no. And the cast is great, too. I thought everyone, you know, we didn't mention much about the cast uh, other than we love Danny Glover, but I thought they were great. Yeah, I did, too. I thought uh, phenomenally cast, actually. And that's one thing that makes it's like any movie that we've talked about. But I think that makes it sell really good. I'm actually curious about 
James uh, Rodé Rodriguez. I liked him a lot. I, there was a sympathy to his character, to his approach. There's a good comedic timing to how he delivered. Um, I did, by the way, uh, read one article from Tommy Brown that said uh, once he met James, he said it was over. That was I didn't need to see anybody else. I knew that was the person I wanted to play Dan. Right. Um, but like you mentioned, Danny Glover, I thought, and Robin Weiger uh, was was great too. I thought uh, casting was phenomenal. Really yeah, and, good. And Candy Alexander, she wasn't in it a whole lot, but she played Dot. She, I thought she was fantastic. She was great. Yeah. She she and, she is a perfect opposite for Danny Glover in this context. Yeah, absolutely. They they had a great chemistry between the two of them. It's one of those things where you you look at that and go, oh, they're probably really married. Yeah, it felt like like it, it felt real. You yeah, know, that, the chemistry was there. Um. So, yeah, I mean, seven point one, seven point one, great monkey warriors. I mean, there's a lot. This one, that's the thing about this one, Alan, is we have a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of options here to choose from when it comes to the rating system on how you're going to attach it to some kind of proper yeah. story. Could have gone pots of coffee. Could have gone uh, medicine bottles. I mean, it, it's all over. Yeah. Insurance cards. Insurance I mean, cards. <laughs> pithy child expressions. <laughs> Cliched quotes from an old, from an eight year old. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I didn't feel like it fit into the story, I, I thought the kid that did it, the little girl was a uh, darling cute. Yeah, she was. This is, uh, well, look, this is a little bit shorter of a cast. I mean, and I'm okay with that. Usually we, we this isn't a cast where we're going Coen Brothers deep three hours. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or listen to me geek out about Hitchcock for two hours. Or Hitchcock. That's <laughs> right. My, uh, my recommendation is go watch Pushing Dead. Alan's is not. He says that's a negative, although he didn't rate it completely bad. No, it's not a bad movie by any stretch. Um, and I think, like Alan mentioned, you can go find it on Amazon Prime. This is Gabe and Alan with the Tame Aperture podcast. Go check us out at tameaperture.com. Check for our previous episodes. Also, give us suggestions on new episodes to watch and review. And uh, until next time, uh, take care, everybody. It's Tame Aperture. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Almost had it. <laughs> <laughs> I should keep that in there. Yeah, it's good. This is the Tame Aperture Podcast signing out. The Tame Aperture Podcast is produced by Dutch Angle Pictures in association with Studio B Productions. Listen, watch, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube.